Welcome everybody to part three of this DevRec webinar series entitled Tech Recruitment Unveiled, How to Build a Winning Partnership Between HR and IT. Before we get started, I've got two quick housekeeping things to get through. Uh, first of all, please send in your questions. There will be an open Q&A session at the end of today's discussion. So if you've got any questions for our panelists, you can fire them in there and I'll ask them to them at the end of the discussion. You can also put them in the chat box, which is already active at the moment. Um, so perhaps our panelists can answer them throughout the discussion. And second of all, this webinar is being recorded. So if you can't make it to the end of today's uh, discussion, or if you'd like to share it with your colleagues, you'll be getting the link to the recording uh, tomorrow morning. So keep an eye out in, on your inbox for that. Okay, um, I think it might be a good time to introduce our panelists, some of, some of whom you might remember from our earlier DevRec webinars and some, some new faces as well. So I think I might begin with Trent, we'll go left to right. So Trent, thanks very much for joining us again. Can you give us a few words about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Trent Cotton, I'm the Senior Talent Director for Hatchworks. We're a technology solutions provider and also provide staff augmentation for both onshore and nearshore. I've been in recruiting for 18 years now and uh, also wrote a book called Sprint Recruiting. It's uh, applying the Agile and Scrum methodology to recruiting. Thank you very much. Um, all right, Dominic, thanks again for joining us. Uh, can you give us a few words about yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm uh, Tom. I'm a CTO at DevSkiller. I'm also still a hands-on uh, engineer. So I'm doing a little bit of coding and a little bit of managing here. And I'm like, extremely interested in the recruiting part of my uh, job position because uh, apparently recruiting is at, at, at some level in your career, recruiting is actually one of the most important factors that you do uh, as, a, as a software engineer, not to mention a, a manager or CTO. So yeah, I'm really glad to, to be here. Thank you. Uh, Chris, can you give us a few words? Thanks very much for joining us. And can you give us a few words about yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm Chris Clark. I am the head of talent acquisition here at Theorem One. Uh, Theorem One is a consultancy. We work with large enterprise organizations to solve business problems. And we are a fully distributed team, have team members in over 40 countries around the world. Um, we're at its size of about uh, 375 now, which we've grown quite rapidly over the past two years. So a lot of talent acquisition. Um, my background is definitely not talent acquisition at all. So uh, I was a product manager just two years ago. Uh, I used to lead our, our product team here. And uh, yeah, uh, Thomas, as, as you said, uh, at a certain point in your career, hiring becomes the most important thing. Uh, and that's a very true statement. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much for that introduction. And last but not least, Angela, thanks very much for taking the time for joining us. Can you give us a few words? About yourself? Absolutely. My name <clears throat> is Angela Druckmann. I'm a certified Scrum trainer. I started my career in development but pretty rapidly went into project management and had the great fortune of having my very first big project be my worst project ever. Classic IT disaster project, millions of dollars over budget, way late. That really got me thinking there's got to be a better way to do this. And some years later, I discovered Scrum. So now I work with my clients pretty much all over the world, five continents, 23 countries, um, to help them use Agile practices like Scrum to avoid disaster projects. Awesome. All right. Thanks very much for those introductions, guys. Uh, now, before we get started with our planned discussion, I thought I would just do a quick introduction about DevRec, about this series, um, and give you guys a bit of background about what we covered in the early parts of the series if you weren't here. So basically, DevRec is a three-part series um, focused on successful HR and IT cooperation uh, for tech recruitment. Um, during part one, we heard the perspective of technical recruiters and HR professionals. We just heard from Trent, who was who's present during the, the first part of this discussion, and he was joined by a couple of other HR professionals to hear their side of the stories, the, their side of the story, excuse me. Uh, the way we did that is we looked at the different areas of the tech hiring process that required the most improvement for HR and IT cooperation. So we looked at everything from the job advertisement to screening, interviewing, the hiring process, the actual hiring decision, and looked at areas where there could be improvement between, improvement between HR and IT. Uh, we also covered some tips on how to work better with the IT hiring manager at every single stage. So we took polls with the audience. We, we covered a lot during that discussion. Just a quick note here that all three of these recordings will be shared with you guys next week. So keep an eye out for them if you weren't present. Um, but moving along, so in DevRec part two, we were joined by IT professionals. So we heard from HR on the first panel, 
<laughs> from IT in the second panel. In this one, we we focus on frustrations from IT working with HR and looked at some strategies on how to basically overcome these challenges. Now, in part three, we took a slightly different approach. We actually surveyed you guys, uh, the audience who registered for this webinar and asked you to answer a couple of questions which were basically aimed at addressing or recognizing the pain points and frustrations from HR that they have towards IT in the tech recru recruitment process and by the same token, IT have towards HR in tech recruitment. So the top three for HR were lack of clarity and job requirements, the feedback loop, and the amount of time dedicated to the process. For IT and their frustrations towards HR were the knowledge of job requirements and certifications, lack of technical knowledge, and poor job descriptions. So these were the top three voted uh, sort of frustrations, pain points that we had from you guys um, for each, each persona, essentially. So yeah, today, what we're going to cover we're going to, this discussion is going to be purely based on your insights and preferences. You're going to hear from both HR and IT professionals on each of these points. We heard from our panelists at the introduction that we have people from both sides of the story. So we, we want to hear perspective on each point and try to lay to rest any of these doubts on how to get this corporation to work. We want to have an, an aligned HR and IT teams for tech recruitment. That's the goal of this, of this series, essentially. So I will stop sharing my screen, which is probably stopped now, which is good. And jump into our first question. Before I do that, I think I'm, it will just be important to point out that we're going to start with the HR pain points. So we're going to start with the HR uh, frustrations, then move into the IT pain points. And then we're going to, we've got some actually open topics that were also voted on in this, this pre-webinar pre survey, which were some of the things that you guys wrote in to say that you'd like to see us covered. And we picked the best ones out of them and made some questions accordingly out of that. So basically, thank you for your patience for that introduction and, and for hearing the rundown of what we've got planned for today. And, I'll, and I will jump into our first question, which uh, Chris, I, I might start with you. And we looked at those HR frustrations and the biggest one there was a lack of clarity in the job requirements. Um, and that basically is the biggest pain point for HR people working with IT. I wanted to know your thoughts on improving this particular situation for better cooperation between HR and IT. You might be muted, Chris, sorry. I'm mute. Uh, th this is definitely an interesting one um, and certainly one uh, that I've seen both sides of. I, I used to be the, the hiring manager on the other side waiting for the candidates and, and now I am the, the talent team delivering those candidates. And the biggest thing I would say is, is that um, as uh, fr from the HR perspective, from the talent perspective, you, you can't expect that they are going to, uh, the, the IT teams are going to give you everything that you need, right? They, they don't know how to talk about this. They don't know what the job market looks like. They don't know how candidates talk about this. So it really comes down to you trying to figure out how to build a language with them and how to communicate these things. Um, you know, it, you need, it, it's actually your responsibility in HR to get a deep understanding of the way that they work day to day. And not only of the, the rec uh, that you're trying to fill, but all the different roles that this person that you're hiring is going to work with. Because when you understand the whole team, you can understand how one will balance the other. Um, and you need to go through and say, you know, hey, you know, if this candidate is an expert in this, you know, but they ha and they have everything else, would you pay for that? Um, because it's going to cost more if, they if they're overqualified. If the candidate is missing this skill set, would they be able to survive on the team? And you need to kind of operate with these extremes to be able to figure out the language that you, you can share with that HR team. Um, one of the biggest things that I've found is that people, you know, always demand senior, but they don't really know what senior means. So giving them real tools uh, to be able to articulate what a senior engineer is um, you know, being able to, to really go through a list and say, you know, it, in DevOps, are you expecting them to be able to design and implement by themselves? Do they design and implement with a team? Do they just implement? Do they not touch it? Um, that's going to help you figure out, yes, they need a senior person or they just really want a senior person, but they don't actually need a senior person or don't expect them to operate in that fashion. Um, so again, it really comes down to building that language. Um, here, I just kind of listed a couple of tools, but it it's it's really what starts the conversation with you and your hiring managers to be able to understand best how to succeed. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely a lot, a lot to go off there. I really appreciate it, Angela. I wonder maybe from your perspective, from sort of the IT perspective, 
we're talking about this sort of lack of clarity in job requirements. Do you have any tips on how we can improve this and pr- improve that communication between HR and IT? Sure, absolutely. This is something I'm always working with my clients on is trying to help them hire people who are actually going to be good team members on an agile team. <clears throat> One of the things that really complicates that is there's not a lot of standardization in job descriptions and job titles. Um, I have a number of clients, as an example, that are government clients, and they have bizarre job titles. Like, it it really doesn't give you a clue as to what they do. Here's an example. Senior IT consultant. What is that? (laughs) Is that a developer? Is it a project manager? Is it a scrum master? So I think it's worth the time of IT people to kind of sit down with their HR folks and say, okay, who knows what the job title will be, but these are the things I want you to look for in the resume. Um, Maybe a senior IT consultant is actually a business analyst. And and so you want to look for things like being able to create a business requirements document, going out and working with business to gather requirements, Um, being able to articulate those to a technical team. Um, Because I find that this lack of consistency in job titles has a lot of confusion. It creates a lot of confusion for people. And the other thing it creates is really great candidates slipping through the cracks. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to kind of dig past titles and get into, okay, describe for me what you did. And then, um, then you can kind of get a sense of, okay, this is a candidate that we want to talk to. Yeah, yeah. Don't start with the job title by the sounds of things. Start with the requirements. Then you can, I mean, it's, it's interesting you also brought up the, the point about job descriptions. This is something that we talked about pretty much at length in the first panel. Trent, you might you might remember this as we, we actually voted on this from the, from the audience and this was the number one um, issue that, was ha- that uh, the audience was having is that, working out these job description and it's a pretty good pretty good uh, idea to approach it by don't start with this job title first of all figure out what you need that'll shape your title then you can figure out what you need for your job description as well so i really appreciate it this reminds me of an anecdote uh, i remember there was an interview with tim berners lee for those of you who don't know it's the guy who actually invented World Wide web he is the one who actually came up with the idea of like almost the internet and the, the 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 caption on on the tv like interview was that he's a web developer which is technically correct but Inventor, maybe a little off <laughs> a little off and, and and i like um you know I, I like the discussion and and especially i've recruited in a lot of different industries tech has always been kind of the one I'm like because it changes so much you know it's been four years since i've been this close to tech recruiting and you know Four years ago, five years ago, I was recruiting, you know, .NET developers. Now and then, I get in, you know, to this role, and they're like, "We're looking for React." I said, okay, that's fantastic. What is React? You know, <laughs> where does it sit? Um, so for 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 me uh, to get them out of that, I'm looking for a senior software developer. I don't even give them the option. I'm like, paint me a picture. You know, imagine that you're a kindergartner and you're trying to explain something to me. All you have is crayons, and all I can understand is what you paint. Paint me a picture of what this role needs. And what, what I like about that is that <clears throat> you get into some of the tech pieces. You know, yes, I need four years of React, you know, three years of you, no GS, whatever. But then you also get some of the competency aspect of it. And I think that that's where you can drill down and say, okay, you say that you need a senior, but it sounds like you just need someone that can take a kind of a predefined box and color about an inch outside before engaging manager. So that's more of a, it's kind of a mid. And the other thing that that um, that we do is, is we have a uh, AI and ML powered sourcing tool, and so I can actually build while they're talking about it. I'm building that search, and and of course the AI is updating the candidates and you know everything from location to the tech stack that they're looking for, uh, even if we want to go after different country uh, companies. But if they they start to see that number you know, kind of dwindle down. So, it, you know, as an example, um, I need someone that's got experience in Rust. Okay, fantastic. We need them in Latin America. <laughs> Watch this. And I hit enter and it went, Zoop, you know, and the manager's like, wait, okay, well, maybe not. I mean, we need Rust, but we can teach them Rust. C++ is a good thing. You know, that that's kind of a good baseline. So I, I think, you know, recruiters, sometimes we just go in and we just take everything down. 
I think leading with that data is going to enhance and enrich that that job description build out. And and if you do it the reverse way, you're not looking for what was it the senior IT consultant? I think you said. Um, you know, if you put that in the title, you're going to get 40 million of those just in the United States. But if you build from the skill set and the competencies up, then and and just leave the title irrelevant. You're you know to to the earlier point, you're going to have candidates that don't have that skill set. You know, maybe they're a cloud engineer and maybe they can do some QA automation because of the tech stack that they've been doing and some of the projects they've been working on. So it, it opens up that that candidate flow. And for for me, who doesn't know a lot about technology, it establishes a little bit of credibility with the with the hiring manager. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's about getting aligned as well as much as anything. Like early early on, which is what we're we're trying to cover here, because uh, if the expectations, the alignment is there at the very beginning. <clears throat> things are going to work out better moving forward. Um, yeah, I, I do appreciate all of those answers, guys. Uh, I'll move along. I might stay with you, Trent, actually, because we saw the second biggest pain point. This is the second highest voted pain point from HR when working with IT is the feedback loop. Um, and I wanted to know maybe if you could share some of your experience, good or bad, with with this particular issue and, and, and on the bad side, perhaps some advice on how to improve it. Yeah, so whenever I started recruiting, my hairline was here. Yeah, like right about here. And the lack of feedback is just consistently driven. I'll be bald in the next 18 months. Um, And and it's actually one of the core principles in sprint recruiting, uh, because I found that whenever I was developing the methodology coming out of agile and scrum training in 2017, I kept thinking, okay, there's got to be a way if they're doing this over here and it's working and something very complex with a lot of moving parts, I've got to be able to apply it to, to recruiting. And so the first thing I did is I downloaded uh, the candidate information. How long do they spend at each different section of uh, the swim lanes within within the requisition? And it is one of the few times in my career, a minor statistics, I love data, one of the few times that the roadblocks were like, bam. And it was with the hiring managers. It was from the time that we, we, we found candidates quick. It was two weeks before we got feedback. And then once they interviewed, it was three weeks before they decided who they wanted to hire. And then it was another four days trying to get the damn offer approved. And so what we did is we put in a 48-hour deadline. And I loved it because whenever we train the managers, and whenever I do sprint recruiting training, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, let, let's watch. Because as soon as I start enforcing that, everyone gets their feelings hurt. You know, it's like, no, no, we can't do that. We use it as a competitive advantage. So I like to be able to talk to my candidate and say, hey, Justin, you know, I really like your background. I think that you're going to be a fit for one of our couple of roles. I'm going to submit you over to client A, B, and C. You will know in 48 hours whether or not you're going to move forward with A, B, or C, or all the above. That, that In this kind of a market, sometimes that's all I can get to get that candidate to stay with me. And then on the flip side of that, <clears throat> when we're talking with clients, and uh, I think I pulled this two sprints ago. You know, we had viable candidates that were sitting between, you know, a couple of different, you know, client groups or hiring managers. And one was slow, one was not. Well, guess where the candidates went? They went to the ones that were fast. Because that's what's first best for the club, for the candidate, because I own that candidate experience. But it's also great for the client. And, you know, you're just naturally going to gravitate toward those hiring managers that honor that 48-hour deadline. So I think, you know, for for hiring managers, they have that FOMO, you know, hey, I interviewed five candidates, go find me five more. And then they're surprised five weeks later that the first two that you submit that you said are probably the good ones, they're no longer in the market. That was two or three years ago. I mean, good God, if you don't respond sometimes in, you know, 48 hours plus 12 or plus 13, you're out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's setting that deadline and setting that expectation with the hiring manager on the front end. And then letting them know this is not a this is not a contract. Okay, this is an SLA. You do your part, I do my part, and and we'll be hiring partners, and we'll we'll move this forward. And the one that benefits the most is that candidate experience. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Time time is money, both in oh gosh, literal, yes. a literal sense and also just the uh, candidates aren't mm-hmm. going to stand waiting around for you for sure. Um, right, and especially in, in in IT, you know, they live for deadlines. You know, I mean, everything they do is on a deadline. So, so play to that and, and, you know, kind of speak their language a little bit and say, okay, what's our deadline for this? I send you this. I want an answer by this date. And then for you, recruiter, set a timer in your calendar to remind you to go get the, go get the feedback. Yeah. 
for sure. Justin, um, I have to interject here absolutely. and just really second what Trent is saying. As a, a company trying to hire, you are at a huge disadvantage if you dilly-dally. I am getting a chance to see a real-life version of this right now. My youngest son is a software engineer, and he is ready to move on to a new position. And he um, he did what I told him to do, which is go out, get a solid offer, and then interview, 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 and get a bunch of other offers. And that's exactly what he's done. So he's in a really powerful position. He's playing employers off each other. Um, and that's great for him. But it's not so great for the employers, especially for the very first company that gave him an offer because they kind of dragged along and like, well, you can start in a month. When you tell someone you can start in a month, if it's a smart person, they're going to go out and get a bunch more offers and use it to get to get something better. Yeah, there's, mm-hmm. there's certainly no lack of, uh, of demand for for software developers, engineers. So, yeah. You really got to be moving quickly, and yeah, so it's a good, it's a good yeah. approach actually as a candidate. For I, sure. I told a hiring manager, uh, I think last week, that uh, he says, well, "You know, why do you like to move so fast?" I said, "Whenever you know, whenever I date someone, I don't wait two weeks to see if they're going to respond. I mean, I'm all I'm over them like a fungus if I want to be with them. Companies need to kind of take that that same approach of going, this is the talent. Justin is exactly what we're looking for." Heaven and earth needs to move to get Justin and let Justin know from the get-go, before even day one, I value you, I value your time, I value your experience, and I, my behaviors support what I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah. That's the piece I think a lot of hiring managers are missing, that recruiters, we don't con- we don't convey that to them, the importance of this. Yeah, practice, practice what you preach for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tomic, I mean, you've been a technical candidate yourself numerous times throughout your career you've also been a hiring manager i wonder from your perspective um you've got a lot on your plate especially a cto at dev skiller but how do you find time for the for this feedback to keep you know keep the process moving along well you just have to understand that some things are very like time sensitive as you already mentioned so when you're when you're unemployed this is very stressful as as a, as, a, as a candidate, you know, as a software engineer or whatever, and you have to understand that. And if you get an offer within like twenty four or forty eight hours from someone, you're not going to be waiting even even further for other uh, other offers because you already got something. So yeah, why why, why bother? Uh, especially if I can like start uh, straight away next week or whatever. Uh, so I did I did receive a few times when I was recruiting. Uh, people who actually gave me a re- uh, gave me a reply when I was very fast, and they gave me a reply that yeah, I, I, that's great. You, I got this offer, but I'm still waiting for a, a reply from another another company. Uh, but more often than not, uh, you will be in a much more advantageous position. And if if you are the first one, and if your offer is okay ish, then like that that's all because candidate also knows that either he or she accepts the offer or it's game over, we have to move on uh, because the candidate also like cannot drag along this process for, for, for too long. And if you are honest, that's okay. If you are honestly saying that you are also waiting for an offer from a different company, I can wait, but my mind is clear. I know that I did everything I could, uh, but like if, if someone is faster than you, then well, that's 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 just game over. You're not gonna you're not gonna get that candidate, especially on the market we uh, we have right now, where the unemployment in among software engineers is actually very low. So don't expect people to just like sit there and waiting for uh, for your offer. And regarding the actual process, how we can structure it inside a company to make sure we are like hitting the deadlines. So we can approach it from from like two perspectives. The one is like very technically technically oriented so to speak so like use some ats applicant tracking system use some i don't know jira trail or whatever set up deadlines set up processes set up reminders whatever and that works and uh, the bonus point is that you get auditability so mm-hmm. if you didn't get this wonderful candidate at any point in time you can see your process and you can ask this particular person, 
hey, John, why didn't you respond within the uh, agreed SLA? I really like the name SLA here. It's like uh, typically comes from the DevOps culture, but we can apply it here as well. So, so we can always ask a particular person, why didn't you respond? Maybe it's because of you, we didn't hire this great candidate uh, because you had all the information. Why, why, why didn't you respond? So this is kind of the tech side of this. And we should probably, uh, even more importantly, build a culture where you actually have have empathy. You understand that this person on the other side actually waits for your uh, response. If it's a senior, probably that person has like a ton of other offers. So he, he or she is not waiting eagerly for your response. He, like she will just forget about you in, in two days. If it's a junior, if it's someone after bootcamp, whatever, and then that person may be really, really eagerly waiting for, for a reply. So why make these people uh, anxious or, or, or nervous or whatever? I mean, what else do you need? You have a CV, you have have uh, feedback from all your engineers, whatever. I mean, what 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 holds you back? That's something that's un unimaginable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, and we do, you know, because we do sprints, we have a retro at the end of the sprint. And um, I mean, this sprint, there's three candidates that we lost because the client dragged their feet. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the, and, and I know all three of them by name because I've been watching and I've been after the recruiter, I've been after the CE. And so, you know, part of our retro is going to be, all right, this was the perfect candidate for three different roles. We went all in here. Why? Mm -hmm. And how do we how do we avoid this insanity going into the next sprint? I think that that's one of the things I like about kind of having that retro is it gives you a chance to go what's working so we can scale it mm -hmm. and what's not so we can address it and not continuously repeat. And then from a prioritization standpoint, going into the next sprint, if client A takes four days to give us a response and their response is let's put them through another tech interview and i've got 40 other jobs guess what that next sprint that that client there they drop to the bottom of the priority i'm going to go to the ones that i know whenever i find the candidate get them interested in hatchworks and working for us that that client's going to move just as quick because it's not just that client's brand it's also hatchwork it's it's yeah. my brand mm -hmm. uh with that with that candidate yeah yeah for sure. And and out of curiosity, like how long are your, your sprints actually? Like do you do two, you, weeks. two weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It, it's a good period of time because you, like you said, you always get this opportunity to look back over it um, and mm -hmm. address, address, you know, strengths and weaknesses in the process. Um, all right. So we uh we've kind of finished off with our at our HR side, HR frustrations. There were there was another one in there, um, out of the top three, but in the first panel that we had, we really sort of uh, dug pretty deep into, into that issue there. And it's the same actually with IT, one of them, which is this uh, lack of technical knowledge. We spent quite a lot of time in DevRec2 talking about that. So we're not going to go too far into that one today. What we are going to focus on is actually the number one voted uh, frustration from IT. And that is the uh, HR not knowing the certifications or requirements needed for the job. Um, Angela, I, I wondered maybe if, if you could sort of expand on this on, in your experience and, and how you kind of deal with this issue throughout your career. Sure, absolutely. This is a huge pain point for my clients. Um, they, get, they get a lot of confusion in getting candidates that are certified, whatever that means. I teach certification classes in Scrum, so obviously I believe in it. Is it that little stamp after your name, certified Scrum Master, that makes you great? Nah, no. It's that you spent two days with somebody like me. If you think about it. If Let's say you're trying to do an agile practice like Scrum and you're having trouble. You ask a colleague for help. How many places has that person worked at and used something like Scrum? Maybe 10 or 12? I've worked with hundreds of companies. So that's the advantage of coming to spend a couple of days with somebody like me is you get that benefit of the knowledge. Unfortunately, um, a lot of organizations out there have figured out they can kind of work around uh, 
certified scrum master, certified scrum product owner, and they can phrase it a little differently and get away with creating Justin's agile certification. And, you know, it's, there's a stamp for you. I have a client right now that got bitten by this in a big way. Um, this is a, a state government in the United States. They have a huge multi-million dollar uh, government project that they're going to be embarking on. They hired a lady um, to be a scrum master, who's kind of the person who guides the process in scrum. And they asked her, are you certified? Uh, she said, yes. Uh, so it turns out she was, um, she got one of these fly by night certifications where you take a little exam online. Uh, you spit back what you know, they want to hear. Um, and woo, you are certified. And of course she didn't even have rudimentary knowledge of scrum. Um, she made a mess of it. They had to, they had to get rid of her and it slowed the whole project down. So this is a huge pain point for my clients. And I think um, beyond just looking for the real certification, that term, certified scrum master, certified scrum product owner, that's owned by the scrum alliance. The only person who can grant you that is a certified scrum trainer. But again, what you really want is the fact that somebody has spent two days in a class with someone who knows what they're doing. Um, and has gotten advice based on real world stuff. When we um, when we survey people after they come to our classes and we ask them out of everything we did in class, what were maybe one or two things that really made it for you? Like it really made it valuable. What always sits at the top is the real world stories. They wanna hear what really happens. And in my classes, especially, we definitely, we talk about the good, we talk about the bad, and we talk about the really, really bad, because I want them to hear these things for when they're, they're going out to, uh, to do this in the real world. So yeah, uh, a proper certification doesn't guarantee you anything, but it at least says, okay, this person this person actually learned from someone who has a lot of experience in this and knows what they're doing. So I would say for my clients, that's been a huge pain point. Sure. Yeah. I think it comes back to the point of the legitimacy of the certification as well. I mean, we talked about this in our DevOps series last year. We, we had a couple of uh, separate webinars about DevOps and DevOps recruitment. And uh, we spoke about the value of of the certifications, particularly in the DevOps space, but I mean it does vary. And and Chris, I, I'd pass it over to you. Um, what do, what do you think about this particular point? Um, and have you had any issues with this um, over at Theorem One? Yeah. Uh, what what I would say is um, it, exactly what you said, Angela. Talking about um, real stories, um, we we at Theorem One we we run a series with product managers that we call. Uh, war stories. We want to know when it went bad because that's when you learn the most. So we bring a lot of people together and they just talk about times where they've really come up against the wall and how they solve those problems. Um, it's really effective um, to talk to a candidate and talk about the things that they've done in the past, not because you're 100% basing your evaluation on like, is, did, is what they do now exactly what we're looking for? But we're really interested in how they take something really complex and they, they distill it down, how they approach solving problems. Those are all really, really positive indicators about a candidate. When we look at, at the certifications, a lot of times for me, certifications become a red flag, not because there's something wrong with that certification or it's not helpful. It's probably incredibly helpful for their skill set. But the people that kind of sing their, their certification and their the top of their resume is a banner of certifications. They're just collectors that are out there to get, get all this stuff. They've attended lots of classes. They're not really there to um, you know Im, Im, improve their career by learning something. They're there to improve their career because they can attach another acronym at the end of their name. Um, so for us and at, at Theorem One, certifications are less about being able to understand that candidate more um, and more about understanding the requirements. If we go back to that first question, if someone comes to me and they say, I need the characteristics of this certification, that tells me so much. And that's part of the, the language that you can build. Yeah. Once you have that characteristic, maybe you do go find a candidate that has that certification, but 
what you actually have is a rubric that says what I need are people that think and act in these manners. And I can go find someone that's certified or not that has those qualifications because we now have that common artifact on both sides of the hiring manager and myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I don't, I don't know if uh, Tomic or, or Trent, if you have anything you want to add here or we're going to move along. Um, actually, I agree. I don't see much value in the certification space or industry or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Um, okay. I, uh, Moving along, one of the one of the other big big pain points that we came across, and this was actually so, sort of from both both sides, uh, and it comes back to this point about communication um, and how to communicate, particularly with the hiring manager. This is one of our our talking points that was voted upon as well in the in the pre registration poll. Um, Trent, I, I, I'd like to ask this question to you, um, and I wondered how can you use communication strategies to strengthen the relationship between the hiring manager and HR. Is there any anything you can share on this in, in your experience there at uh, Hatchworks? Yeah, absolutely. Or, or just throughout the career, um, I always like to be, well, in school, I got in trouble for being like a Riddler because I always asked why or how. Um, a lot of teachers didn't like that. They just wanted you to just do the math and work and, and not ask why something was going. But in, in recruiting, I think, it, I think it's helpful. Um, some recruiters that I've worked with, they want to go in and act as though they know everything about the business unit. And I think you you get a lot more relationship building if you just go and you just spend time with them, like do what they in the life of. So if you're recruiting, you know, DevOps people and you have an opportunity to go into the office or sit in on a couple of the meetings and watch that DevOps in in, in action and be able to ask them later and say, okay, well, why did you ask that? Or, or what were you talking about here? It's, it's actually a point of vulnerability that I think recruiters shy away from, but I like to embrace because it, I found that one, I learned more. And then two, I learned more about the individual that I'm supporting. So it's like, I'm kind of developing a two-sided relationship. And those are a lot more forgiving whenever you do miss the mark on a candidate or you do miss the mark on a, on a process. So I think establishing that on the front end with the intake is, is probably an opportunity missed by most because most recruiters sometimes will just take the JD and go, yeah, yeah, I know what you're looking for. Even if I do, I want to ask a couple of questions um, to, to kind of focus in on that, that relationship piece. So uh, whenever I was in banking, you know, before I became a recruiter, I was, I was a banker. I knew what a private banker did, but that by the time I started recruiting, seven years had gone by. So things had changed. So I went and spent time with uh, a couple of our, private bankers and learned about their portfolios, learned about how they met with clients. And, and I asked the leaders, who are your best? I want to go sit with them. So not only was I kind of understanding what the bar in the company was, I was also, you know, kind of showing that I was willing to sacrifice the time. So that hiring manager, whenever I sent somebody over, I said, Hey, this person's a lot like John. They remind me a lot of like John. And let me tell you why it gives them an, an immediate baseline to be able to say, okay, well, well, if they're like John, John's one of our top performers, you know, yeah, definitely. They don't even look at the page. They don't look at the resume. I'm making that, that, that connection with them. And I think that's an opportunity lost in, in building that, that very strong communication. The, the other piece is I like to communicate with people the way they want to be communicated with. Mm -hmm. um, I love the memes out there. This is, you know, that, that shows like a cat face and it's looking at the phone, like, why is it ringing? It's like, why are you calling me? Just text me. And if we need to call, you know, we'll set up a time and we'll, 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 we'll talk. I talk all day long. I don't want to talk when, in my personal time. And, and I think that a lot of managers are that way and recruiters get frustrated. I sent you an email, I sent you this, I sent you that. Well, if they're always on Slack and that's their preferred mode of communication, Slack them. If mm -hmm. they don't like Slack and they like to be on the phone with you for five or 10 minutes, book five or 10 minutes, but get that information on the front end. How, Mr. and Ms. Manager, Mr. and Ms. Executive, how do you want to be communicated with? And then follow that and have like a little rap sheet of your, your hiring managers. Yeah. It's interesting that you, you brought up this word relationship a few times. It's a buzzword that we kind of avoided a little bit in our in our promotion because it can, can be like a, there's a kind of personal connotation with it. We were talking about cooperation and partnership, but in reality, it is a relationship between the hiring mm -hmm. manager and, and, and recruiter for sure. And I think the, the techniques that you talked about, because you've got to get to know them to understand how they, like you said, how they like to be communicated to if it's Slack or a call or in the office face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's absolutely true. Um, Tomic, thanks very much, Trent, by the way. And, and mm -hmm. Tomic, I was wondering, uh, from your perspective, do you have any uh, advice here about, about communication strategies or how to go about it? 
Yeah, so uh, the, the, the first thing is that we should actually just like appreciate each other and understand that we have certain skills that the, the other part is lacking. And once we understand that, and it's again, kind of the em empathic thing. And so once we understand that, we can actually embrace each other. And that's why we named this series DevRec, because we would like to build this kind of um, synergy. So, sorry for being that, uh, that cliche, but that's, that's, the, that's the thing we want to do here. So um, when, when I was young, I was like, thinking of hr people like these uh like people wearing ties and not knowing anything about java and javascript ha 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 they they cannot tell apart these two technologies and i can only imagine what hr people were thinking about me like i am this the, this guy sitting in a dark room and doing coding and really awkward socially awkward and so on and so forth and uh times have changed so the the recruiters are now tech recruiters so they do understand that they can tell the difference between java javascript typescript ecmascript and so on and so forth uh developers on the other hand really like try to at least senior ones or the ones who try to be senior ones and by the way that's how i that's how i would define a senior developer that they are actually working on their soft skills rather than just like tapping the keyboard as fast as possible uh, so at this point we are like coming closer to each other and whichever communication medium you choose that that's that's your call although i hate receiving phone calls as well uh, but but anyways like uh, just appreciate each other and respect each other and the communication will just like flow and of course it, it helps a lot if you are if you can like like sit in the same room for a few hours and just have a have a meeting rather than just exchanging emails because there's always this barrier like it's it's us and them and the whole point of the devops movement and the devrec movement which we're like trying to uh, bring to life here the whole idea is that you are supposed to work as a team the the socially awkward technical people and the the hr people which are actually fantastic and they can tell a lot about the candidate which i wouldn't spot uh, for example like uh, is this person going to be a team player or is this person the the, the one that's like uh uh, treats like the work seriously and so on and so forth because the only thing I can assess is like how how well she is doing with coding. Uh, so the, the the communication will flow once you kind of understand that the the the, the person on the other side tries to help you. Like you have a, a, a same goal. Yeah, and eliminating like these these silos basically. Like you said, we're we're trying to bring the two sides together, and that's. <laughs> exactly why we we named this yeah. series devrec you know because it's it's trying to sort of bring it together get aligned um yeah to move forward more quickly and effectively um thanks and, and tomic, tomic, there there are a ton of socially awkward hr people too so <laughs> let, let's not let's <laughs> not discount that okay socially social butterfly developers as well let's let's not get it oh my gosh <laughs> I, I, you to say something also double down on the honest and earnest communication right it, it's it's about building that relationship and and the number one uh, coachable moment that i have with my team is just to stop selling right you don't go in there and put up this wall and be ready to get them excited about this person now behind the scenes yes of course that's the goal but you need to use a mechanism that they're going to understand and that they're going to get excited about and what you really want to do is go in there and be as honest and open as possible here's a candidate i happen to like them they have these flaws. You can overcome these flaws because you have these aspects of your team. If you talk to them about what's really going on in their world and how this person is going to help them, like, let's be really honest. That's why they're hiring someone. They need help. This person will help you. Consider them. Think about them in this way. Preload some of that stuff. If you need to, you can start selling at the end. But uh, if you go in there and you say, like, this is the best developer I've ever seen or the best one we've seen in the past six months, <laughs> It, the the bullshit goes up way high, <laughs> um, and uh, you're going to get flagged. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, how how would we even know? You know, because I mean, we're yeah. not we're not in the business every single solitary day. Yeah, uh, the, yeah the trick of the matter is that we don't, because um, even right. they don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah, well, thanks, guys, very much for those insights. So I've, I've got another one of these sort of open conversation topics, which was uh, it's kind of steering away from what we've talked about, but it was uh, voted upon by by our registrants. So we want to try to cover it. Um, stop selling here. I'm seeing another comment coming through. And don't forget, if there are some questions you'd like to ask, you can you can fire them in there because um, we are coming up to our sort of Q and A period of time. But Angela, I wanted to ask you a question about interviewing. This is something that came up quite a bit across the series and also in, in this most recent recent 
uh, registration poll. And I wanted to know maybe some of you, the interviewing techniques that you can share with our audience to keep candidates engaged. Basically, the concern is that we kind of touched on it even in today's discussion that candidates are involved in many processes. Even your son is involved in four or five different recruitment processes. How do we keep them engaged? Maybe there's some, not just in the interview stage, but in general, how are we keeping candidates engaged? Yeah, I do have some thoughts on that. Um, probably one of the number one things that I share with my clients is if you are using agile practices like Scrum, tell people about it. So I have a client that is uh, a different state government. I can tell you who it is because I wrote a case study about him. It's Nevada Department of Transportation, not something you would associate with Agile. They were having a heck of a time getting good candidates because of a couple of reasons. One, they're in the state capital in Nevada, which is Carson City. People don't want to move to Carson City. They want to move to Vegas. (laughs) <laughs> which is a long way away. And their job titles are bizarre. They have nothing even remotely related to regular industry. So what we did is we wrote a case study on them because believe it or not, they are one of, um, I would say my top five clients as far as totally adopting agility and making use of practices like Scrum. We wrote that case study solely to help them with recruiting. And the last time I visited with them, they had a couple of candidates that they had hired who told me um, I applied for the job because I read the case study. So if you're doing cool things where you work, um, especially if you're in an industry that people have preconceptions about, I think it's super important that you get that out there. Tell people about it. Um, Let them know that, hey, this is a really fun, cool place to work. As far as actually interviewing, um, the thing I always encourage my clients to do is um, start your sentence with, sentences with, tell me about a time when you did X. Mm-hmm. Not, not just spieling out, um, as I think others have said, spieling out things that uh, you read out of a book or you got in your class and you can regurgitate it. But you want to hear about times that they did things. Um, The other tip I would give uh, recruiters and employers is they're going to be asking you questions, too. And you want to be aware when they're asking you pivotal questions and answer them well. So when I do my classes, one of the very first things I do when we're introducing and getting to know each other is I say, if you're comfortable telling me this, how many of you are actively interviewing right now? In a Scrum Master class, it's usually going to be about 40 to 50% of the people. So what I give them, if I know I have a bunch of people, is I give them interview questions to ask. It's a very short list of questions, but the answers are incredibly revealing. They're going to tell that person if the company that they're interviewing with really understands agile practices like Scrum, or is it just blah, blah, blah with the buzzwords and they don't know what they're doing. And what I always tell my class attendees is it's never my intention to tell you not to work for someone. I just want you to know what you're getting into so that if you take on a position where they're doing things like Scrum really poorly, you knew that ahead of time and you're okay with that. And presumably you have the experience to go in and clean because that's what you're going to do. You're going to go in and clean up. So I think as employers, you want to get um, really aware uh, for whatever position you're interviewing for, um, what are the pivotal questions that might be coming back at you and really think through how do you want to answer those? Uh, One of the questions that I tell, I'll just give this as an example. Um, I give my classes, I tell them to always ask it last. And always ask it of the highest ranking person in the room. And this is the question. I'm just curious, why did you decide to do Scrum here at your company? Now, that sounds like a really simple answer. 
But you will be amazed at how uh, revealing or question, but the answers are just so revealing because you're either going to get something that sounds like they're trying to hit buzzwords, you know, well, teamwork, global enterprise, synergy, blah, 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 or you're going to get something that's related to their business. Um, and I always tell people that I think if, if I owned Wonder Woman's lasso of truth, you know, yeah, she puts it around people. They have to tell the truth that if I if I put that around most people who are using agile practices like Scrum and force them to answer it honestly, the honest answer would be because everybody else is. Doing it. That would be the honest business. Okay, that's somebody who understands, yeah. right? We lost, uh, we lost that's you for just a moment there, Angela. The oh, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I got no a little flash up that my connection was unstable. No worries, Hopefully no, worries no worries, no worries. We're, you're back, you're back. Thanks for that. Yeah, but um, that's what you want to hear. You want to hear something related to their business. So I guess these are just a few techniques to think about that, you know, what you want to get from your candidate are real things that they did. Uh, and I have no problem asking trick questions either. Um, a question, for example, I would ask of a scrum master is something like, uh, tell me about a time when you had a team that was underperforming. How did you get them to perform? That's a total trick question for a scrum master because scrum masters don't get anybody to perform. But you have a lot of people who, again, sat through those two days just to get that stamp and their former project managers. And you're going to hear about how they took control of the team and directed them. OK, that's not the candidate you want for an agile team. Yeah. Yeah, trying to trying to reveal the truth out of out through these questions essentially. Chris, thanks very much, Angela. Chris, you wanted to add something there. Yeah, I, I mean, I I want to definitely agree with both of the points that An Angela made there. It, it's it's a matter of uh, for, for me, it's selling culture, right? People are going to be excited if they're really excited about what's on the other side. People have a lot of choice in the market right now, and if if you spend the entire time just grilling them with questions, that really sets the tone of what it's going to be like to work there. Um, one of my favorite ways to interview a candidate that I'm really excited about personally is to just open format like, hey, I'm here to answer your questions. I'm, I'm going to get you excited. And I'm really explicit with that. The point of this call is to get, get you excited about it. And I format it in a way where they can just start the conversation with as many questions as they want to understand me and my company. Um, the once you're actually in that conversation, one, you're going to learn a tremendous amount based upon the questions that they ask and what's important to them. But two, when you're actually in a conversation, you can start weaving all of your, your normal interview questions in and they won't even know that they're being interviewed right now because they're so deep into that conversation. Um, and they walk away saying like, oh man, the entire time went by and you didn't ask me a single question. I get that a lot. And it's like, you know, that's okay. I learned a lot during this call. And you, guess what? I want to move you on to the next round because I really enjoyed this conversation. People feel really, really good about that process. Yeah. Yeah. It works, works both ways by the sounds of things, which is, which is really interesting. Um, well, thank you guys very much for that. Uh, I don't see any open Q and a questions. There have been a few in there that are being answered. Um, but yeah, if there's anything else you guys would like to ask, to our panelists, you can do that now. But I would like to move on to actually our last question. And uh, we're going to ask this actually to everyone, but I'll probably start with, with Trent and, and Tomek, or maybe we'll start with Trent first and move over to Tomek, because you guys have been present through uh, most of the series here. And as we're trying to lay to rest the concept of, of uh, let's say, uh, unsuccessful or ineffective HR and IT cooperation for tech recruitment, this, the concept of this DevRec series, what are some final thoughts any anything you can think of that maybe we've we've covered already that you'd like to elaborate on, or even something that we haven't covered, that will go that people can take away today um, and put to put to effect um, at their companies in, in improving this cooperation between HR and IT. To Trent, maybe we can start with you. Sure. From a TA side, remain intellectually curious, humble, and listen more than you talk. Those are kind of my my guiding guiding terms. I don't do the last one as often as I should. But that's something I'm trying. I've been working on it since I was 17, but maybe one day I'll get it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Tomek, thank you. Thank you, Chad. Tomek, what about you? What, what, have, what have you got to share with you? Uh, well, I think there's a lot we can learn from each other, the tech and the HR uh, silos, so to speak. 
So just like listen to each other and try to learn uh, as much as you can. So the tech people, that the engineers should try to, to, to teach a little bit of technology to HR people so that they don't feel stupid and they don't make stupid mistakes. And many software engineers are laughing at the HR people because of the aforementioned Java versus JavaScript dispute or whatever. And on the other hand, the technical people can learn a ton regarding soft skills, regarding how to speak to people. Uh, whatever you just said about like uh, having a conversation versus uh, a bunch of Q&A, which sounds like very unnatural. And uh, that's also like one of the uh, one of the things that, that the technical people uh, can learn from, from HR. So, so learn from each other and kind of respect that you are professionals in your respective areas. Yep. Awesome. Both great pieces of advice. Uh, let's go the whole way around. Angela, maybe you, you can share some final thoughts here. Yeah, definitely. I think that um, in in my line of work, one way that we've kind of improved that connection between the technical part of a company and HR is to get HR using some of the same techniques that the technical people use. Specifically, as Trent was talking about, he actually decided, hey, this thing called Scrum, it really could work well in what I do for a living too. It's probably not a coincidence that um, the client I told you about, Nevada Department of Transportation, their first huge um, Scrum project was an HR project. I have another client that I was with a couple of weeks ago in oil and gas. And sure enough, their first big projects are in HR digital transformation. So I think that that can be kind of a, a cool way to, to share with each other. You know, um, I have one client in Houston, in the United States and Texas, that runs their whole company with Scrum. Every department, finance, HR. Um, and it's interesting, they even send their um, administrative assistants to my class. And I asked them once, why do you do that? It's expensive. Why, why do you do that? They said, it's easier for us if everybody thinks the same way and speaks the same language. So I think that's kind of the key between technical people and HR is trying to, to take the first steps to speak that same language. I think that's where we're going to get some commonality. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Um, well, thank you. And uh, Chris, thank, uh, do you have any sort of final thoughts on, on this, on this DevRex series as a whole? Absolutely. Yeah. For, for me, um, you know, where I try to lead my team is is a place where you're not afraid to try something new, um, and you're operating as as honestly and uh, in such an earnest fashion that um, you know you 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 know that you're going to succeed because you just put that effort in. Um, don't be afraid to to try that thing that is really scary and you're not sure it's going to work because it it just might. Yep. All great pieces of advice that. Uh... Maybe we can bundle together. I'll, I'll reach out to you guys individually and sort of put this together and, and share it with you guys. Um, I do see one question that, Tomic, you might be the best person to answer this one, um, which is how important is web accessibility when it comes to software development? Could you? Uh... Uh, oh, very good question. So um, if you do not pay attention to web accessibility, so everything related to, to people with various sorts of like uh, uh, disabilities, uh, you are excluding a whole bunch of folks from your recruitment process. And this might be not that problematic. Okay, I mean, it's it's terrible because you are excluding people for some reason, but this may not be such, uh, such a problem in any other industry. But in the tech industry, it's... Uh, it's a very practical and pragmatic problem because I did recruit quite a few people who were on wheelchairs, who had uh, various disabilities and so on and so forth. And it didn't matter at all. I mean, after all, you're just sitting sitting in front of a computer, and the, the most of your uh, most of your work is just thinking and like designing code. So by excluding a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of people just because your recruitment process is not accessible in in any by any means. So your office is not accessible, your screening platform is not accessible, and so on and so forth. You are actually losing a lot of potential, and it has like to be honest, it, it has nothing to do with polit. Poli being, polit being politically correct or making sure you're inclusive and so on and so forth. Of course, of course, these are all like the most important 
uh, most important parts. Uh, but the, the the thing is that you are actually losing talent because like there are, there's a ton of talented people who are perfectly suited to do the IT work, uh, even though they, they have some disabilities which have like no influence whatsoever on, uh, on their work. Uh, I was actually interviewing a few people on wheelchairs and I had no idea they are, they are on wheelchairs uh, until I actually saw them in the office when they had the contract because it happened like remotely. Uh, so, so accessibility is important important and it's 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 in your best interest to uh, have your platform have your process have your office space whatever accessible to these people yeah something that we we're certainly trying to do at Deskular as well um all right i think uh that's it for the the q a and it's actually we're right on time which is perfect timing so i wanted to say uh as always, perfect timing, I might add. We, we do, seem to do pretty well. But uh, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining us today. As I mentioned at the beginning, there will be a link to this recording tomorrow. And next week, there will be a link to all three of the recordings plus some additional material that we'll be sending you guys over the coming weeks to kind of expand on this topic um, of HR and IT cooperation and the DevRec concept that we've sort of born here at DevSkiller. So once again, thanks very much for joining. Thanks for joining if you joined multiple series, um, multiple panels, sorry. Um, and finally, thank you very much to our panelists. So Angela, Tommy, Chris, and Trent, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your insights. I think it was really insightful for everybody. And yeah, have a great day or evening wherever you're joining from around the world. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.